Welcome to the Register's Report. My name is John Buckley. I'm the Register of Deeds of Plymouth County. This show is about Plymouth County real estate. Our headline for the month was Hot Real Estate Market Defies Conventional Wisdom During COVID Crisis. In the first segment of the show, we're going to talk about some of the numbers for the month. This being October, the month I'm going to talk about is last month, September. In the second segment of the show, I have a great realtor, Sid Elliott of Ravis Real Estate, talking about the current state of real estate and a little bit of his advice for how you can navigate these very difficult times to purchase real estate. And we'll also talk about some of our county and colony history. So let's go right to the numbers. You're going to see a bar chart of deeds. Deeds show sales of property. There are 1,142 deeds recorded in September, more than the 1097 in August, 29% more than last year. Uh, we're still down 5% for the year, for the nine months of, of 2020, uh, but the highest number of sales in 2020. The average sale price is up, and you will see that that uh, reflecting in uh, the difficulty of purchasing property. You get to see an image now of sales. We have 27 communities in Plymouth County. Each of them have had sales of property. You can see the numbers running from January through September on this chart. Uh, next, you're going to see a bar chart of mortgages. Um, mortgages have been off the chart again. People are using the low interest rates to refinance. There were 3,261 mortgages recorded in September, up from 311.12 in August. For the fourth month in a row, it's the highest number of mortgages in 10 years. We're up 42% compared to September of last year. And for nine months, we're up 50%. Foreclosure deeds are a different story. Because of the moratorium, foreclosures are very low. There are only, only two foreclosure deeds in September, less than the eight in August, 94% less than last year, and we're going to trend lower until the moratorium is lifted. Uh, it's scheduled to lift this coming Saturday, so we'll see what happens in the near future with foreclosure deeds and also with foreclosure notices. You're going to see a bar chart of that. There are only seven foreclosure notices in September. A foreclosure notice is when somebody is in trouble, when it's starting uh, to see uh, the difficulty of paying um, a mortgage and it's affecting your ability um, to keep the mortgage companies from foreclosing. Um, it's another document we really want to watch closely as we go through a period when the moratorium comes to an end unless the governor or the legislature extends it. And you'll see a listing of foreclosures in orders of notice uh, for September. A lot of zeros there again, uh, but that will change. Um, electronic recording has been a huge help to us during this time period. We recorded about 83% of our recorded land documents over the internet and about 55% of our land court documents over the internet. Um, again, we're watching very closely the foreclosure moratorium, which is scheduled to end October 17th without uh, relief, which I mentioned. Um, it'll be, be very important uh, for those that weren't able to pay their mortgages to try to find a way forward. Welcome back to the Registers Report. My name is John Buckley. I'm the Register of Deeds of Plymouth County. In this segment of the show, we always do something educational. We've had surveyors, appraisers, commercial real estate brokers, everyone that's been involved in the real estate community. And of course, realtors are our favorite individuals because they are on the ground and know exactly what is happening out there in the real estate market. So I have a great guest in this show. Sid Elliott of Ravis Real Estate uh, from the Norwell office. 
and Sid is going to talk about uh, what has been happening in the real estate market from his perspective and a little bit of a crystal ball for what we may see going forward. But welcome, Sid. Thank you very much, John. Um, as John said, my name is Sid Elliott. You can I just look at me, just talk okay. conversation okay. with me. As I said, um, I live in Hanover. I've been there for 42 years. I've been with the Ravis Real Estate Organization in Norwell for um, almost 14 years now. But totally, I've been in real estate since 1992. I was, prior to that, I was in corporate America and I was downsized twice in the early 90s in two successive years. And my wife, who's always been my strongest advocate, said to me, why don't you um, go into real estate? You have your license. It's always something you've wanted to do. She at the time was working in corporate America and carried all the benefits. And I went to work for a wonderful organization called DeWolf. And DeWolf eventually merged with Hahnemann and they became Coldwell Bank of New England. And after a couple of years with Coldwell Bank of New England, I went across the street on Route 53 to the William Ravis Company. And they came out of Connecticut. Norwell was their first office in Massachusetts. And they came out of Connecticut and now they are a really moving force in the real estate community in Massachusetts. Um, they've gone nice, steady, slow growth, very innovative in their technology. That's an awful lot to catch up on. And during the pandemic, I'm sure um, there's a lot of people like me that are tired of Zoom calls and Zoom meetings, <laughs> but it's the only way that you um, manage to get things done nowadays. And it, it's an amazing industry. Um, it can be very frustrating, but the reward is when you successfully transfer a piece of property from one owner to the other, and everybody leaves the closing table with a smile. So the world has changed with COVID. Yes. But, but even before that, I, I have noticed in my time, you haven't practiced real estate as an attorney, mm -hmm. the changes of how realtors go about their business, how fast purchase and sale goes back and forth, mm -hmm. uh, most of it uh, online, most yes. of it mm -hmm. um, with, with tech changes that have right. mm -hmm. happened over the years. You want to talk a little bit about those changes? Well, when I first got into the business, um, you went to the local real estate board that you had, have to belong to. You have to belong to one real estate board. And at that time, it was the Plymouth um, Association of Realtors. and. They have since formed a partnership with the Fall River um, Greater Board of Realtors, and we are now known as the South Shore Board of Realtors. And we're the second largest board in the Commonwealth. Uh, Greater Boston Real Estate uh, is the largest one. Uh, we have about 3,100 members, plus or minus. And it's a, it's a great, but we used to go down every Thursday and we would get what we call the book. And Thursday, Thursdays the book came out and on Friday the Patriot Ledger real estate section came out and they were probably two inches thick. Everybody scrambled to get that on time and to update all of that. But then um, multiple listing came in. Um, and they put everything online. And it's instant update. And you see what's, what's, come, what's new on the market, what's had a price break, what uh, has an accepted offer, uh, what is coming back on the market. And you just have to check that constantly. And because your sphere of influence and your, your clients either buyers or sellers want to be informed immediately as to what is going on in the real estate market. Well, there seems to be, over that time period, a lot of changes from the buyer's perspective. Yes. There's so much uh, access for them to get things just over the internet. Right. Um, it's amazing because um, there is always 
innovation and change for the consumer, and it's driven by the Massachusetts Consumer Protection Agency. Um, home inspections, Title V came in, mm -hmm. lead paint came in, and now lead, Massachusetts led the way in the lead paint law, and now it's a national law. And then the last, latest one, oh, we also had flood insurance. The latest one to come in that affects everybody is buyer agency. Mm -hmm. And buyer agency was introduced, oh, you lose time. Um, I think buyer agency came in approximately seven or eight years ago. And it clearly defines who is represented by the realtor involved. Um, either you either represent the seller or you represent the buyer. And in certain cases, with everybody's permission, you can become a dual agent. So, and which is very tricky to do. There's a lot of people that do it successfully and a lot of people that strain while they're doing it. But it, it really is a good plus for the consumer. Uh, there was a lot of resistance to it when it first came in and now everybody seems to have adapted, as we all do, with change. So let's talk a little bit about our current market. I know we had a conversation before the show about how surprising it is with all the other challenges that other sectors have that real estate has been so strong. Leading up to the pandemic, John, um, real estate was on a gradual, steady, upward movement as far as sales and pricing. Since the pandemic, you have to sit back and say, when is it going to stop? Right. Um, we have had a decrease in the number of sales up until August. We have had a increase in the median price. We have had a decrease in the amount of inventory. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all driven by a s slow, steady mortgage rate, which according to the Fed Federal Reserve is probably going to stay slow and steady and almost to the zero level through 2023. I think the lightest date I heard, but when you when you're showing houses in the pandemic, are you sh you know either as a s listing agent or a selling agent, you schedule them and you are asking people to buy what is most likely their largest asset after seeing it for a maximum of 15 minutes. And then, because of the total lack of inventory, you are having bidding wars if the house is in great shape in price right. Um, I just had, I had a very sit funny situation. I had a client I was representing um, in Duxbury. I sold their house in Duxbury in March, right after the pandemic hit. The closing was in the parking garage in Newton on the back of somebody's Mercedes that no one in the party owned. Um, they, had some, they had another house in Maine, which they would go to, which they went to, and when I saw a house that they liked, I thought they would like to come down and look at it. Well, they lost four houses due to bidding was. They came down, it was in the company showing, I couldn't, we could not, the listing agent and myself could not get our schedules together. He honored me. They went to see it. He showed it to them. They bid on it. And we closed on it. And I had never seen the house. Wow. And I said to them, I think that your maximum on this property should be X. If you exceed it, you could be underwater when the bubble breaks. And that it's going to, it's going to eventually hit that they're no longer going to appraise. And people are waiving their appraisals. Which yeah, yeah, we've seen and heard yeah. instances mm -hmm. right. of people um, outbidding each other by up to $50,000 on the price. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. With no, and eliminating the home inspection. Well, 
that's just dangerous. to get that's the property. Kind of and that's how bad it is because yeah. you figure inventory uh, is down in our area um, almost 60% over last year. So there's nothing coming on the market. Um, and not all properties are selling rapidly. Um, antique properties that have not been updated are lingering. Um, your flip market is pretty much dried up. Mm -hmm. um, but property that, and I think that some people are base, when you go in to do a market analysis, you give a range, or I give a range, a low and a high. And the, con the seller only wants to hear the high. And sometimes when you put it on the low, it creates a bidding war and it exceeds the high. And then we, you say, well, you sold it once to a consumer, now you have to sell it to a bank. Um, because the mortgage appraisers are getting um, a little more difficult. I believe it. They are getting more difficult. Mm -hmm. So with that kind of an atmosphere, what would your tip be to a buyer looking to move out of their house and downsize or upgrade based, based well, upon Well, a lot of people, when they hit retirement age, uh, they become empty nesters, are reluctant to put their house on the market because there's absolutely nothing to go to. Mm -hmm. um, some people are opting to the over 55 compounds. Some people don't even like the over 55 compounds. They have an issue with going to a condominium rather than a house. Mm -hmm. And you just have to guide them. But if they want to sell, um, what, I what I normally suggest is they price it realistically. Mm -hmm. Because we all know that the final price, the sale price, is set by the buyer. And it, it's been that way, and it will always be that way. And if you want to sell it, put your house on the market and sell it, you have to be realistic as to what, it, what it's worth. And not everybody lives in a million dollar mega mansion. Right. They may think they do, but they don't. So when a buyer comes to you, what mm. are the prere prerequisites for them to have a chance in this market? Yes. Um, all you can do is advise them of the current market. And I only go back three to four months for sales, comparable sales. And you go through the process and you advise them what you would recommend they purchase this house for. If they choose to go above that, mm -hmm. that's their choice. Mm -hmm. I mean, and there's nothing you can do about right. it, John. Right. They just want to be in. And a lot of young people are doing that because of the lack of inventory. So most people come to you with a pre-approval letter, I assume. Oh, definitely. Definitely, in that pre-approval letter, it used to be six months old. Now we're pushing for two months, no yeah. more than two. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And nobody will let you in the house without, without that, I'm told. No, no, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> not. Um, and we, you also have to guide some young first-time home buyers that maybe a single family isn't for them. If they can get a hold um, of a good multifamily, be it a two-family, triple deck, um, and use that as a stepping stone and help some have somebody else help them pay the mortgage mm -hmm. while they're saving money for their initial single family. Mm -hmm. And you know, as as you know, in most parts of Plymouth County. There is not an abundance of um, multifamily housing, right? Especially on the South Shore. Right. You get down into um, a new area of, of SSR, and uh, you go into Fall River and New Bedford. Um, right. I have a friend in New Bedford who put her house on the market a week ago, Friday. They did a traditional open house on Saturday, and she had 17 offers huh. in one day. Wow all over asking wow and that's in fall river wow so it's um it's 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 the same no matter where you go in this area there is no sign 
of the real estate market slowing down. I think it may slow down depending upon the outcome of the November election. Um, but there again, because of the pandemic, we are seeing a lot of young people coming to the suburbs out of the city. And a lot of them are currently current renters, so they're first time home buyers. And there's not a lot, in my area, my immediate area, there's not a lot of first time home buyer stock. So agents are finding themselves spreading further out. Um, Pembroke is a great up and coming town. Hanson is a great up and coming town. And then you're even going further into Halifax. Brockton is an extremely hot town. Brockton has some very good um, first time home buyer properties. Mm -hmm. and, in with pro the, and programs. Yeah. yeah. And with the, with the um, wonderful um, transportation out of the city um, into Boston, it, it's, al it's also a, ver it's a big plus. And it's going to continue because when they put the train down the south coast, you're going to see that area boom. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So Mass Housing has a number of good programs. Mass Housing has some wonderful yeah. programs. Um, and young, young, there again, the real estate community has to educate the sellers that there's nothing wrong with a small down payment loan. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people do back away from um, FHA and VA loans because there are some additional uh, inter um, inspections that have to go on. Mm -hmm. But those people are just as well qualified as your traditional 5% down. And actually, we all like the 20% down because um, there's, it's, a, it's a float through loan. I mean, it's a very easy loan to push through. Mm -hmm. But the smaller interest loans do take a little bit more time. And, um, but we all started someplace. And for first time home buyers, do you have any quick tips for them? Come in with a clean credit report. <laughs> Update, you know, if you're thinking about buying a house, one of the first things you should do is investigate your credit report. Make sure that everything on it is legitimate. If there's anything that you want to challenge, challenge it immediately. And if you think you can pull your score up sufficiently in nine to 12 months, take the time and do it. Uh, because the cleaner the credit report, the higher the credit score, the better the um, pre-qualification is going to be. So share your contact information one more time. Okay, sir. it's Sid Elliott at ravis.com, 617-529. 4976. Uh, office is 515 Washington Street in Norwell, 02061. Thank you very much for Thank joining you. me in my show. Thank you, John. A lot of great information. Great seeing you. Great, okay. as always. I want to thank Sid Elliott for the great job he did talking about the current status of the real estate market and some tips uh, to navigate what is a difficult market because of inventory in other issues. Um, in this segment of the show, we always do something lighter in nature, uh, a little bit of our county history and colony history, the holidays for the month of October, National Taco Day in the 4th, Columbus Day on the 12th, United Nations Day on the 24th, National Chocolate Day on the 28th, and Halloween. It'll be a different Halloween this year because of COVID. Uh, the first image you're going to see is one of our notable records in the county side. Uh, the Cable House in Duxbury was an old bank building where they ran a transatlantic cable from Brest, France, to the town of Duxbury. It was done in 1869 in the laying of the cable on the ocean floor um, was very important in terms of changing technology 
to share information across uh, the ocean uh, is, and share information between continents. The cable house is still there, um, and you can see a plaque on it if you were to drive by. The next notable record, uh, based upon the fact that we're fast approaching the World Series, again, in a very funny time for baseball with the COVID impacts, uh, but there's one person who grew up in Plymouth County who was a member of the Cooperstown Baseball Hall of Fame. Mickey Cochran grew up in Bridgewater. Uh, Mickey Cochran was a very interesting person. He went to Boston University where he led it in five sports, baseball, football, basketball, hockey, and boxing. He's known as the greatest catcher of his era, one of the greatest catchers of all time. Played for the Philadelphia Athletics and the Detroit Tigers. He won five pennants and three World Series in two American League Most Valuable Player Awards. He was a firing competitor and was a great friend of the most fiery contender of sports history, Ty Cobb, but his career ended when he had a fractured skull from a wild pitch. Um, next is a notable record, Hastings Keith. Hastings Keith was our last congressman from Plymouth County. He lived in the town of West Bridgewater. He was a leader um, in the establishing of the Cape Cod National Seashore. He was a congressman from 1958 to 1972, and he um, began his political career in the Massachusetts Senate, and he represented um, Plymouth County, except for Brockton, all the way down to Cape Cod and the Islands. Um, there was a uh, issue that came up during his tenure whereby there was a cranberry scare because of the uh, chemicals they used for the cranberry bogs, people were afraid it was causing cancer and causing injury to people. And he led a study that uh, disproved that. And because of Hastings Keith, the cranberry industry has been and will continue to be a major industry in Massachusetts, particularly as you get down into the towns of Carver and Wareham. And last but not least uh, is our Plymouth Colony Record of the Month. It's the Treaty of Mutual Protection. When the colonists arrived in Plymouth uh, in 1620, this is the 400th anniversary of that arrival. Unfortunately, because of COVID, those celebrations are pushed over to next year, but they were concerned about their safety. They joined together with the Wampanoag tribe the Wampanoag tribe at the time was concerned about the Narragansett tribe uh, dominance. So they joined together in a treaty of mutual protection and they agreed to defend each other if either one was under attack and agreed to send to them uh, the individual who caused any problems with each other. It was a great relationship that lasted uh, for many, many years and certainly something that will and should be celebrated through this 400th anniversary. I want to thank Lorna Green Baker, Christine Richards from our office, for helping me put this together, along with Mike Simmons and Emma Reardon, who worked for Brock and Cable Access today. Uh, she did double duty, both on the cameras and in the control room. This is my 120th show on Brock and Cable Access. I, I burn a CD and send it off to cable um, stations throughout Plymouth County and share with you what for most people is the most valuable asset. And it is very important to understand what's going on in the real estate community. It's a hot market right now. And uh, just be aware of that as you consider your real estate options. So we'll see you next month. Happy Halloween. Thank you.